Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. During the Second World War, many nations occupied by the fascist powers developed underground movements dedicated to seeing their countries liberated from Axis oppression. While many of these groups caused considerable damage and disruption to their occupiers, none were more successful than the Yugoslavia partisan movements. Though starting off as little more than a fractured collection of independent guerrilla bands with wildly differing goals and ideologies, the men of Yugoslavia would eventually be welded together into a fighting force that could stand up to the Third Reich in ways that no other insurgency could ever hope to match. While the Red Army would be instrumental in dislodging the Nazis from the country in 1945, their arrival would be little more than the final blow against German occupation. Among the many issues faced by resistance movements is that of communication. If your country has a hugely diverse population of at least 10 different ethnic backgrounds, people from villages only a few miles apart might struggle to understand each other, even in the national language. So if you ever find yourself having trouble conveying a message, or need some assistance with communication in general, Grammarly could mean the difference between success or failure. Grammarly is the digital writing assistant of choice for 30 million people a day and works across multiple platforms for maximum coverage. Download the free version which also includes a tone detector which checks to see how the tone of your writing comes across to others, as well as other aids to help with basic grammar and spelling suggestions. Or upgrade to Grammarly Premium, which allows even the most consummate professional to save time and money with advanced features like clarity full sentence rewrites and tone transfer transformations, making your writing concise, clear, and confident. I use Grammarly every day to format company emails, review scripts like this one, and effectively communicate ideas to my team. Get through those emails quicker and keep your work concise, confident, and in the right tone by using Grammarly today. Go to Grammarly.com slash Armchair Historian to sign up for a free account and get 20% off Grammarly Premium today to help you work more efficiently. The emancipation of Yugoslavia by its own people seems all the more impressive when one considers their unenviable geopolitical situation prior to war. In addition to sharing a land border with both the original Axis powers, Germany and Italy, Yugoslavia was a nation in name, riven from within by endless social, ethnic, and political issues. With a citizenry comprised of Serbians, Bosnians, Croatians, Slovenians, and a dozen other minorities, Yugoslavia had stumbled from democracy to dictatorship before finally entering the 1940s under the control of Prince Paul, who was acting as a regent for his teenaged relative, Peter II, until the latter came of age. With a pathetically obsolete military, shambling economy, and numerous German, Croatian, and Slovenian fifth columns busily undermining his central authority, Prince Paul was in an incredibly precarious position by 1941. Though a determined Anglophile who spent most of his free time in Britain, Paul was repeatedly courted by the Axis powers, who were desperate to secure Yugoslavia's natural resources. Completely out of his depth, and knowing full well that his nation stood no chance against either Germany or Italy, Paul was forced to choose the path of appeasement by signing the Tripartite Pact on March 25, 1941. But Paul had already infuriated his Serbian-dominated military by making concessions to the Croatians earlier in his regency, and they promptly orchestrated a coup that placed the now 17-year-old Peter II in charge. By now, Yugoslavia was completely surrounded by the Axis powers, and the new government immediately opened desperate negotiations with the Allies in the hopes of somehow averting the inevitable. Unfortunately for Yugoslavia, Hitler took the coup as a personal insult and swore to destroy Yugoslavia as a state in revenge. The German high command quickly scrambled to create an invasion plan, and on April 6th, the Luftwaffe launched huge bombing raids on Yugoslavia's airfields and the capital city of Belgrade. 
This was immediately followed by a massive land invasion that saw German troops pour into Yugoslavia from four separate directions. The invasion was spearheaded by the German 2nd Army, aided by the 12th Army, and the 1st Panzer Group. With their air force having been all but obliterated in the opening strike, the Royal Yugoslav Army now faced the full might of the Axis on five separate fronts, with Italy and Hungary joining in on the fun on the 11th and 12th of April, respectively. Spread far too thin and wielding an arsenal of charmingly outdated castoffs from a dozen different nations, the army failed to even mobilize before the invasion was underway. Predictably, the sole victory of the Royal Yugoslav Army was against the Italians in Albania, with all other units being utterly overrun within a matter of days. Belgrade fell to German hands on the 13th of April, and the nation was forced to agree to an unconditional surrender on the 18th. The invasion had taken just 12 days and cost the Axis forces just a few thousand casualties, in exchange for gaining over 200,000 Yugoslavian prisoners of war. Peter II was forced to flee into exile abroad, finding refuge with the British. He would never return to his homeland. In the wake of their capitulation, Yugoslavia ceased to exist as a sovereign state, just as Hitler had promised. Serbia became a German-occupied zone, while Croatia became a Nazi puppet under Prime Minister Ante Pavlic. Lastly, the Italians claimed Ljubljana and most of Dalmatia, leaving the nation effectively dismembered along ethnic lines. Yet remarkably, the ink on the surrender terms barely had time to dry before the first resistance movements against the occupation began to coalesce. Remnants of the Royal Yugoslav Army, who survived the initial invasion, fled to the mountainous regions of Serbia and Bosnia, where Colonel Draja Mihailovic took command and began organizing them into a guerrilla movement. Meanwhile, a Serbo-Croatian communist called Josip Tito saw the invasion as a chance to see his dream of a socialist Yugoslavia come to fruition, and immediately set about raising a partisan force that would engage in direct combat with the occupying forces. While the Royalists and Communists were busy forming their resistance movements, the new German puppet state of Croatia was busy planning the genocide of anyone who was not a fascist Croatian. After his ascension, Prime Minister Ante Pavlic moved with astonishing speed to abolish all other political movements and declare the death sentence for every possible crime against the state. Pavlic was completely unrepentant about his plans to annihilate the Serbian, Roma, and Jewish populations of his new state, and empowered his ultra-nationalist Ustashi organization to enforce this ethnic cleansing. The actions of the Ustashe, combined with the general anarchy that gripped Yugoslavia immediately following the occupation, proved a boon for the rebel forces, particularly the communist partisans. When Josip Tito had heard that the Germans had issued a decree stating that 100 civilians would be shot for every German soldier killed by the insurgencies, he quickly realized how to use this to his advantage. Now, after each successful raid, his men offered any bystanders a simple choice. Join the partisans on the spot, or wait patiently for an extermination squad to arrive and murder them all. Knowing that being caught within five miles of a single German corpse was now a death sentence, whole villages defected to the partisans on the spot. This tactic was so effective that in late autumn of 1941, Tito successfully liberated the town of Užice, proclaiming it as its own republic. Royalist guerrillas under Colonel Mihailović also participated in the liberation, but by this point he had been contacted by the government in exile and was understandably wary of cooperating with the openly communist partisans. Before the New Republic was even a month old, relationships between Mikhailovich and Tito had collapsed. By the time the German forces rolled into the area, a civil war was already in full swing, and the disorganized insurgents were easily driven out of the region. 
Following the fall of the Republic of Užice, Tito's partisans began to cautiously regroup in Bosnia, while Mihailović was left to court the favor of the Western allies. He was irritated to discover that his royalists had come to be known as the Chetniks by Allied Intelligence, a name associated with several nominally independent groups within Yugoslavia, including the Black Chetniks, who directly collaborated with the Germans. Mihailović, however, still viewed his men as part of the Royal Yugoslav Army and continued to refer to them in such terms. Though endlessly praised as a hero of the resistance movement in Yugoslavia by the BBC, Mihailović was given very little material support by the Allies, leaving him in no position to wage an effective resistance. Instead, he contacted the government of occupied Serbia and began to quietly collaborate with the Axis forces in the hopes of preventing Tito's partisans from triggering any more reprisals against native Serbians. In contrast to his royalist opposite, Josip Tito took immediate advantage of Operation Barbarossa by launching a general offensive against the depleted German forces in Yugoslavia. Tito's forces had several major advantages over Mihailović's Chetniks, chief among them being access to a corps of veteran soldiers from the Spanish Civil War, and a much broader base of support from Yugoslavia's multi-ethnic population. Yet above all other factors, support for the insurgencies was principally driven by the utter, callous disregard of the occupiers for the well-being of Yugoslavia's citizens, no matter what their origin. Yet even with all of these advantages, the potential liberators of Yugoslavia still faced an uphill battle against a deeply entrenched position. At the start of 1943, the Germans launched Case White, a massive offensive against partisan-held territories in Bosnia. Over 90,000 German and Italian soldiers were involved, alongside as many as 15,000 Chetnik collaborators. Though Tito's roughly 20,000 men would suffer over 50% casualties in the battles that followed, they were able to inflict heavy losses on the much better equipped Axis forces. The turning point was the Battle of Naretva River, where Tito was able to force a crossing into safe territory despite facing overwhelming odds. And despite his miraculous survival, Tito had very little time to rest his men before the Germans launched the sequel to Case White, unimaginatively titled Case Black, this time involving nearly 120,000 soldiers. Case Black was arguably the darkest day for the partisans, as their headquarters was encircled and Tito himself came very close to being captured or killed. In desperation, the partisans threw themselves against German and Croatian troops guarding the Sutjeska River, managing a second breakout in as many months. In retaliation, the Germans slaughtered over 200,000 wounded and injured partisans who were left behind, and conducted numerous massacres in the surrounding villages, but Tito lived to fight another day. As summer drew to a close, the communists had a chance to go to ground and recover from their losses. Late 1943 would also see a major shift in the balance of power in the underground, as Allied agents began infiltrating Yugoslavia in order to make sense of the many chaotic reports filtering back to them about the situation in the area. The agents quickly determined that Mikhailovich's Chetniks had all but switched sides, and that Tito's partisans were the primary source of resistance within the nation. As a result, the Allies withdrew support from the Chetniks and threw their support behind Josip Tito. 1943 was a pivotal year for the partisans in more ways than one. On September 8th, the Italians concluded a secret armistice with the Allies, leaving 17 of their divisions trapped in Yugoslavia. In a remarkable show of defiance, two whole divisions immediately switched sides and joined the Montenegrin partisans, while another joined the Albanian partisans. The remaining 15 either surrendered to the Axis and were taken prisoner, or quietly disbanded and allowed their equipment to fall into the hands of the insurgents. This came just in time for the partisans, as the Germans launched Operation Kugelblitz, or Ball Lightning, against partisan-held territory in the state of Croatia, 
By now, Axe's strategy was simple. Destroy everything, kill everyone, and burn anything that could be of any possible use to the insurgency. And Ante Pavlich's Ustashe had already killed between 250,000 and 700,000 Serbians and ethnic minorities within Yugoslavia. But the wildly disproportionate brutality of the Ustashe only served to drive thousands of willing recruits directly into Tito's arms. By early 1944, Operation Kugelblitz had petered out, having accomplished nothing besides galvanizing even more of the remaining population into open acts of defiance. But Tito's trials were not over yet, as the Germans had one last card up their sleeve. Operation Rososprung, or Knight's Move. Though only consisting of about 12,000 troops, this assault was the most well-planned and surgically minded of the seven major offensives launched against the partisans, involving an airborne assault by the 500th SS Parachute Battalion on the Resistance HQ in the Bosnia town of Dervar. Tito himself was present in the HQ and was forced to take cover in a nearby cave. While the partisans fought a desperate defense of their leader, the Allies sent help in the form of the Balkan Air Force, which launched numerous sorties against the Luftwaffe and German ground forces. As chaos reigned, Tito was able to break away from the engagement and retreated toward the town of Kupres. Though as many as 6,000 partisans were killed in Operation Rüsselsprung, the Germans were eventually forced to retreat, their forces having been decimated in the mountainous terrain around Dervar. The failure of this last major anti-partisan operation signaled a permanent reversal in Tito's fortunes. By now, the Yugoslav partisan movement had become the largest in occupied Europe, with over 700,000 men now openly involved in the liberation. Just a month after having to abandon Dervar, Tito successfully negotiated an agreement with the Yugoslav government in exile, becoming recognized as Yugoslavia's sole legitimate military leader. On August 17th, Tito leveraged his newfound status to the hilt, declaring amnesty for all collaborators. This was backed up by a broadcast from King Peter II himself on the 12th of September, calling for all Yugoslavians to join the National Liberation Army under the leadership of Marshal Tito. This was a devastating blow to Mihailović and his Chetniks, and the movement practically collapsed on the spot, with most of his men defecting to the partisans. Now that the dominoes had begun falling, nothing could stop them. Furthest to the east, the Red Army had reached the borders of Bulgaria, which promptly switched sides and declared itself an allied power. This gave Tito direct access to Soviet military support, and on the 8th of October, a combined Bulgarian-Soviet offensive stormed across Yugoslavia's southern border, and pushed north all the way to Belgrade in less than three weeks. As winter gripped the land, Tito found himself in unchallenged control over the entire eastern half of the country, while the remaining Axis forces were frantically redeploying in Sirmia. During the winter of 1944-45, Tito took the offensive and threw wave after wave of partisans against the Sirmian front, but was repulsed by the entrenched enemy armies. He also expanded operations in central Serbia and began laying the groundwork for a communist regime in Yugoslavia. No longer the underdog, the partisans now began conducting their own reprisals against native Germans, Serbians, Croatians, and Hungarians, executing or imprisoning them in the tens of thousands. Seeing they would get no mercy from the communists, the fascist Croatians abandoned the Sirmian front and surrendered to the Western Allies. As the Croatians wavered, the remaining Chetniks made a last-ditch attempt to win recognition by engaging them in the battle on Lievcha Field, where they were promptly defeated. With their supply lines in ruins from constant partisan raids, the remaining Germans holding Sirmia knew the end was in sight. In April, Tito's forces launched their final offensive, seizing Sarajevo and dismantling what remained of the independent state of Croatia. The last Axis defensive lines collapsed just a few days later, and the Germans began a full-scale retreat out of Yugoslavia. 
Not content with simply letting them go, Tito's forces pursued and engaged a column of nearly 30,000 German soldiers at the Battle of Polana, which actually took place days after the official Nazi surrender on May 8th. This final battle between partisan and Axis forces ended when British tanks arrived on scene, whereupon the Germans surrendered and allowed the remaining collaborators among their ranks to be delivered back to Tito's forces for judgment. With this last enemy force disarmed, Tito's communists were, at last, the unchallenged masters of Yugoslavia. The liberation of Yugoslavia was one of the most remarkable feats of the Second World War. The partisans had grown to outnumber their occupiers and were in control of huge swaths of territory governed by a communist bureaucracy. Not even the vaunted French resistance accomplished even a quarter of what Josip Tito did, but the cost was immeasurable. Yugoslavia was left a ruined nation, with at least a million dead and millions more displaced by the brutal ethnic conflicts. The end of the war brought no relief, as Tito's partisans conducted a ruthless purge of the remaining fascist and nationalist elements in Yugoslavia. Known as the Bleiburg repatriations, these reprisals added at least 30,000 corpses to the pile, and would leave deep scars in the national psyche that linger on to this day. For all his support of the partisans, King Peter II would die in exile in Denver, Colorado. Mikhailovich would be hunted down in 1946 and executed for his collaboration with the Nazis, while Tito would go on to found the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which lasted until 1992 with the collapse of the entire country. <laughs> 